Let's jump in to tonight's Bible study. And uh, the main topic in the next two chapters will be David and Bathsheba. How many have heard of this story before? Yeah, okay, I, I, familiar ground. We've been, uh, you know, the first few chapters, David and Hebron. And then the chapters 5 through 10 was the peak of his career, The David as king. And uh, David and Bathsheba is 11 and 12. From here on, we're going to see a lot of unrest and, and uh, decline. We were at, we're, David's at his peak, but he fumbles this pretty badly. So uh, session two, you remember we, he was made king, takes Jerusalem, organizes his inner group, the mighty men, defeats the Philistines, brings the ark to Jerusalem, but then offers praise. And Second Samuel 7, very key ch chapter in the book where he gets the covenant promise, which is very important to us prophetically because uh, we have much equity in that ourselves. Session three, we talked about his victories, how he organizes government, honors uh, the descendants of uh, Saul and, and uh, so forth. So we're in session four, and this is a little more dismal chapter. We're going to talk about David's famous sin. Not only adultery, but murder, supporting that. But we find his, we'll also explore his repentance, and we'll, we'll detour a little bit into Psalm 51, which is one of the three Psalms that he wrote about this. But uh, so that's by way of review and introduction. You know, it's often crushing for us to discover that a person we admire has faults. In many ways, there's no one that we admire more than David. Incredible general, administrator, poet, songwriter, uh, and so forth. Uh, this is always discouraging when a friend that we admire falls short or a political leader that we support uh, suffers his own particular Watergate, what have you. And often we feel a bitterness that's hard to overcome. And certainly David is one of the most exceptional men. His faith is mentioned in both Testaments, but we discover that he too had feet of clay, so to speak. And uh, the saint is revealed as a sinner. We wonder, why does God hold up as examples men and women who have such obvious flaws. Have you wondered about that? All through the Bible, you'll find the greatest heroes have flaws. So for one thing, we're reminded through all this that God is a realist. His book, the Bible, doesn't contain any let's pretend whitewash of believers. And so we should appreciate that we too can come to God in spite of our own weaknesses. That's part of the message here, I think. God won't overlook them. But he won't be surprised by our failures either. He knows that you and I, we're dust. Now, another aspect, the revealing of the saints' failures helps us, I think, to identify with them. They're real people, not, not stereotypes, if you will. See, if David or Abraham or whoever was represented as spiritually perfect, you and I have a tough time feeling close uh, or similar to them. And so God is trying to teach us through their lives that we too... Uh, are relevant to him despite the faults. And uh, if that's all right for a spiritual giant like David, you know, what, what about poor struggling me? If there's a big gap, we have a problem with that. So the New Testament affirms in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. So let's remember that, and that's what we're really seeing. So we're all bound up in the shared ties of humanity. We're all part of the same family in that sense. Let's just jump in then uh, to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It came to pass, after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. You see, the springtime was the time that, uh, of commencing military operations. Typically, they all uh, stayed clear of the bad weather in the, in the winter. And uh, now this expedition we're dealing with here took place a, the year following the war against the Syrians. And you may recall from our previous discussions that because the disaster of the former campaign fell primarily on the Syrian mercenaries, and uh, thus the Ammonites uh, had not been punished for their insult to their ambassadors and all of that. So this is really a follow-up to what we were talking about in previous chapters. And so David ordered Joab to launch an invasion of Rabbah, the king, which is the capital of Ammon, the Ammonites, if you will. Rabbah is modern Amman in Jordan, incidentally. It was called Philadelphia in the Hellenistic times, but it's about 20 miles east of the Jordan at the head of the Wadi Amman. Now, it's interesting. Most kings led their armies personally, but here David, for reasons that aren't mentioned, they remain in Jerusalem. And this may also be a factor that we should uh, consider it's suggestive in the subsequent events. David should have been with his troops, but apparently he was tarrying in Jerusalem, tarrying in the modern sense of that term. 
Verse 2, it came to pass in the evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now let's just slow down here a little bit and try to put this in perspective. Bathsheba was on her rooftop taking a bath. I won't ask for a show of hands, but how, a rhetorical question. How many of you girls draw the drapes when you undress in your room? Right? You could be on the 12th floor of a hotel. You still do that, don't you? It's a question of modesty, so to speak. Do you suppose that Bathsheba was aware of the fact that the king's balcony overlooked her backyard? I suspect that wasn't a surprise. I suspect she knew that. I'm going to suggest here, I'm not excusing David, but Bathsheba was not without blame. She came at his, she'll end up coming at his request, seemingly without hesitation, and offered no resistance to his desires, at least so far as the record's concerned. If she's bathing there where anyone can look down from a roof, uh, it doesn't uh, say much for her modesty. It may even indicate an ulterior motive if some of the commentators uh, suggest. Now, by the way, uh, she probably was not a stranger, and uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. David, of course, sent messengers, took her, she came in down to him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. David probably had to make a promise or express a stipulation to Bathsheba before she complied with the royal will. Because, incidentally, as we get to know more about Bathsheba, she's obviously not only a, a very attractive, transcendent beauty, she apparently was a woman with superior talents and address. Because first of all, we're going to discover that she'll obtain the object of her ambitions. Uh, she will see that her fourth son will uh, uh, succeed to the throne. She will, her promptitude to give notice of her pregnancy will surface here in a minute. There's some good reasons for that. And in her activity uh, later in defeating Adonijah's natural expectation of succeeding the crown. She's clearly pulling the strings in the palace. She'll express great dignity as the mother of the king when Solomon takes over. So this indicates that she had just natural talents for ascendancy uh, that she gained and uh, uh, maintained over David. Now, by the way, he perhaps had ample leisure and opportunity to discover the punishment of uh, this unhappy connection in more ways than one. Uh, often the punishment and adultery is giving each of them to each other. That's another lesson sometime. But anyway, um, now the woman conceived and sent to David, I told David that I'm with child. Being pregnant by the king, of course, uh, put her in great distress for several reasons. In addition to the uh, king's honor, uh, she also is concerned for her safety because death was the punishment for an adulteress from Le Le Leviticus 20 verse 10. So let's uh, see how this all unfolds. Uh, well, this is just a summary of some of the, the, her talents that I've just covered. Obtaining the object of her ambitions, the, her promptitude in disclosing her pregnancy, her activity in defeating Adonijah's expectation, succeeding to the crown, son succession to the throne, their dignity, and so forth. Anyway, verse 6. David sent to Joab saying, remember Joab. Now Joab is the military commander, and he has served David faithfully for some years. He's the He's the Secretary of Defense, so to speak, and maybe much more. David said to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. Now understand, Uriah was one of the favored officers of David. Get the picture here. So Joab sent Uriah to David. Now when Uriah was coming to him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. So the king's really taking care of this guy. And uh, by the way, a Hittite, he was a Hittite. That empire ended in the 1200 BC, but there's still pockets of ethnic Hittites uh, in, in the Syria and even in Israel. So Uri Uriah is one of these. What's interesting here, David calls him in, get, gets a routine uh, uh, briefing from him. And, and uh, what, what's he trying to do? He's trying to get Uriah to go home with his, to be with his wife. But in verse 9, Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. Now you sort of wonder, uh, was he just doing this out of heroics for his men because he felt uh, 
it improper to take advantage of this visit? Uh, or is it possible that he uh, might have suspected something was going on by the trivial questions and, and uh, the fact that he's being handled in a way that probably was quite unusual? He probably is no dummy. He's probably figured out something's going on here. Verse 10, And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down to, unto his house, David said unto Uriah, calls him again apparently, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? Good question. He's home. He's a chance. He's a warrior. He's home on leave. And Uriah said to David, The ark, the Israel of Judah, abide in tents. My lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest, as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also and tomorrow, and I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. When David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drink, drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his house, but went not down to his own house. So <laughs> that has to be a little frustrating. And so now this crisis you know, of, of, of Bathsheba's pregnancy, of course, is, doesn't have a resolution here. So he'd hoped to bring Uriah back to somehow cover this, of course. And, uh, but the subterfuge didn't work, so uh, he, he tried twice, and it didn't work. Okay, let's keep moving here. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Now, this is kind of ironic, because uh, Uriah will end up being the bearer of his own tidings of doom. And uh, David said, and he wrote in the letter saying, Let, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. In other words, put him in a critical situation and withdraw the support, which is tantamount to you know, contriving his murder. So Joab, was the general, was accustomed to uh, taking human life. Uh, and he served David faithfully for many years. So he probably had a view to his own interests uh, here too, because uh, doing some compromising for David puts him in a, a strong position relative to David. David's going to have to take care of this guy because he's on the inside. So uh, politics here are disturbing. But anyway, it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And guess what? And Uriah the Hittite died also. The text isn't clear that he died because of, of the direct maneuvers, but clearly that was the intent, and clearly he died, so it certainly is unquestionably a, an accountability issue here. Then, then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. He charged, through a messenger, of course, he charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approached ye so nigh unto the city when ye, when ye did not fight? Knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall. In other words, part of the problem was they had gotten too close under the wall. That's why they were killed. And he's anticipating that David will be upset that they allowed themselves that kind of vulnerability. That's bad generalship. And who smote Abimelech, the son of the Jebusheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone from him from the wall that he died in Thebes? This is a throwback to back in Judges 9, you may recall. Abimelech was the son of Gideon. He died by a similar situation years earlier. So, then say thou, thy servant Uriah Hittite is dead also. In other words, Joab instructed the courier who's bearing the news to the king, specifically that Uriah also had died. And he knew, of course, that this would mollify David's criticism, if you will. Verse 22, so the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. And the messenger said unto David, surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto this, into the field, and we were upon them even unto the entering of the gate. And the shooter shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants are dead, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. And David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. So David, of course, has accomplished, this apparently would seem to have solved or resolved his problem vis-a-vis -vis Bathsheba, if he moves quickly. So, and then when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. We don't know how long, but when the morning was passed, it could be as brief as maybe a week or so. Um, and when the morning was passed, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. 
the thing that David did had done displeased the Lord. Because we're dealing here with adultery and with murder. Let's talk a little about David's wives and sons. He had many wives. The first was Michael and Hinnom, who had Ammon. We'll hear about Ammon next in our next session. Abigail, you remember that was Nabal's widow, a pretty sharp gal. She has a son by David called Kiliab. Maka has a son by the name of Absalom, and Absalom is going to be trouble. Absalom is going to lead a rebellion, and we'll come back to that. Uh, Gith had Adonijah. He's also going to have problems. We're going to discover that there's, the sword never leaves David's house, and, that, and Nathan's going to predict that here in the next chapter. But uh, Bathsheba had four sons that we know of, Shemua, Shebab, Nathan, and Solomon. Don't confuse the son Nathan of Bathsheba with the prophet Nathan. They're different people. But Nathan the prophet is very prominent through the coming chapters. The son of Bathsheba by the name of Nathan is important when you get to the book of Luke because that's the path that Luke takes in his genealogy to get around the blood curse of Jeremiah 22. And of course Solomon is the next king. But it tells you something about Bathsheba's maneuvering here to get her fourth son as the heir to the throne. That's interesting. There are other sons, but we'll go on. But Absalom is a guy that's going to be important here shortly. So let's talk about relationships. Bathsheba, when she was introduced, turns out to be the son of Eliam. You may not pick up on that in the earlier verses, but there's a relevance here. And obviously she marries Uriah, one of David's key officers. David comes along, and of course that wipes out Uriah, and he takes Bathsheba to wife. But Absalom, later on, is going to lead a rebellion against David and create all kinds of problems. One of the things that you'll pick up in subsequent chapters is his primary encourager and counselor is a guy by the name of Ahithophel, which is the counsel, David's counselor. Who is Ahithophel? Well, he happens to be the father of Eliam. Now suddenly the fog lifts as you read the subsequent chapters. Unless you put the details together, you may miss the dynamics here. But Ahithophel has never forgiven David for dishonoring his granddaughter and murdering his grandson-in-law. So when Absalom starts to lead the rebellion, Ahithophel sides with Absalom. It's an ill-fated thing, but it's a mess, and that's part of what David's inheriting out of this whole thing, is that the sword never leaves his house. And Uriah, of course, uh, is, is, is a part of Ahithophel's grief too. Well, now that brings us to chapter 12. We're making good, we're moving right along here. Nathan the prophet, we're going to see a lot of him. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich and another poor. He's going to tell a story. This is a very common way of introducing an idea. Now, the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup. In other words, he's a pet in the house, is the point. And he lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. Now, if you've ever, if you yourself or you know as people have had special pets, you, can, you know how dear that can be. So that's the, that's the picture that Nathan is painting here for David. Nathan continues, says, There came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was to come unto him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. So here's the rich man who has all kinds of flocks. He needs a lamb for his guest, and he takes this pet of this poor man. This obviously is you know, getting David upset. David recognized this is unfair this is a bit. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Now, by the way, the death penalty was not appropriate for that kind of thing, by the way, despite all this. Kidnapping was a capital offense. And so if you want to, if you view the lamb as if it had been a daughter, in Exodus 21, 16, you could argue that that's a capital offense. But normally, um, you, you, you would have just to restore four lambs for the one that was stolen is the typical thing. The four for one. I want you to remember that in a minute. Uh, and it goes on. He says, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Now, 
the, the, the capital crime thing is sort of extended here, but, but the fourfold lamb thing is going to be interesting as we go on here. Well, can you imagine? David's enraged by this story. He's really upset. And then Nathan drops his bombshell. Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. David must have been. Can you, can you see the drama? Can you imagine David's reaction? He's been sandbagged here. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king of over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and I gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. This is God talking through Nathan. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him by the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Boy, the sword will never depart from your house. How many sons did David lose? Four. See the, you see, see the parallel? I think that's interesting. I mean, not right away. But, you know, there's Adonijah and Absalom and so forth. Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. See, several of his, you know, one rapes a sister and others, the two different contenders for the throne and so forth. And I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou, dost, thou did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel and before the son. In subsequent chapters, we're going to see that Absalom in his rebellion, deliberately to disgrace David on the rooftop, in effect, before the side of Israel, takes all his concubines. Thou didst it secretly, but I will do, God says, I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. What's David's reaction? This is the key to the whole story. What's David's reaction? He blew it. He did a terrible thing. Can't excuse it. And yet his response is commendable. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child that also that is born unto thee shall surely die. That's the first of his losses, not the last. Given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. You know, that's an interesting phrase. We should keep that in mind. When we blow it, when we stumble, when we fail, whatever, not necessarily like David did, there's other ways to stumble. We find all kinds of ways to stumble. But one of the great, one of the, 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 the uh, byproducts of that, part of the implications of that, is we give occasion for the enemies of God to blaspheme. How tragic it is, whether it's on television or other forms of public media, when we see these charlatans conduct things that have to be an offense, a stench in the nostrils of God. How that gives the enemies of God occasion to blaspheme. Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. Here's an interesting incident we want to study carefully. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. The elders of his house arose and went to him to raise up raise him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with him. So David is really concerned about the child's sickness. And it came to pass on the seventh day, this goes on for a whole week, on the seventh day, the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him the child is dead? They're afraid, they're afraid to tell him. Strange thing happens. But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth, washed, anointed himself, changed his apparel, came into the house of the Lord, and worshipped. 
Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he ate. Once the child was dead, he scrubbed up, went back to, back to business as usual. Now they're really confused. Then said a servant to him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. David said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Now on this little verse hangs a, a, an insight. It's dangerous to make doctrine on a single little glimpse on the one hand. But this is one of several reasons that many theologians take for granted that a child before the age of accountability is saved. Because David says, I shall go to him. In other words, when he, David dies, he will be with his child. David took that for granted. Okay, But he shall not return. The child will not come back to life, but I'll be with him in, in the afterlife or whatever. See, you get the point? Now there's another, as long as we're on that topic, there's another verse you should be, be sensitive to. A highly technical thing, but provocative. In Paul's definitive statement of Christian doctrine, we call the book of Romans. He, of course, does an incredible job uh, laying out the whole role of the law and sin and so forth. Um, but in Romans 7, which he deals with this in some depth, he makes a strange remark. This is Paul. He says, For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. What on earth is Paul talking about? When you analyze this verse, especially in the context of his whole argument, the only thing that seems to fit is that what Paul is talking about is that he was alive without the law as an unaccountable child. But when he understood the commandment, when the commandment came, sin revived and died. In other words, he was dead before the law when he became accountable. It's not obvious just from this verse. I'll leave it to you to go to Romans 7 and study the whole chapter. But when you get to verse 9, that is a, a source of great discussion among theologians. But the only thing that makes sense is to recognize that Paul is saying that he was saved before the age of accountability. It's on the verse here in Romans 7 and the one in uh, 2 Samuel that we draw the view that uh, children before the age of accountability are saved. So let's move on. Anyway, back to 2 Samuel chapter 12, we're at verse 24. And David comforted Bathsheba's wife and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son and called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because the Lord. In other words, Solomon was what David called him, and that's the name that stuck, of course. But the Lord, through Nathan, calls his name Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord. So... Verse 26, Joab fought against Rabbah of the children of Ammon and took the royal city. The finish of the battle we were talking about in the opening of the, chapter, of the previous chapter. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah and have taken the city of waters. And that's a, a, a strange title. Really, it's like water fort is what the word really means. It's the work defending the water supply of this royal city. I might mention that Polybius in his account of the siege of uh, Rabbath Ramon by Antioch's Epiphanes, many centuries later, says that the Syrian king succeeded in stopping the water supply and forced the garrison to surrender the city proper, which was built on the high ground above. So the point is, this vulnerability of that apparently is, endures throughout history. This is when it fell in subsequent uh, battles, it was the same kind of technique. They, they cut off the water and the place had to surrender. So Joab has got this place under control, but he sends to David, he says, Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and be called after my name. In other words, Joab has set this up. It's, it's a done deal. But he wants David to come and take the credit for it. It's good politics for both David and for Joab, actually. So David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. And he took their king's crown from off his head. <laughs> the weight thereof was a talent of gold. That's somewhere between 75 and 95 pounds. That's quite a crown. Don't assume that they wear these things. Very often, you'll see this if you look carefully in some of the ancient uh, drawings and things, that the crown was often suspended over their head. As, uh, that, we always think of them wearing them. Yes, that makes them more, sounds more practical. 
And it was set on David's head. That was probably the precious stones. But in any case, I won't get into the technicals. And he brought forth the spoil of the city in great abundance. And he brought forth the people that were there and put them under saws and under harrows of iron and under axes of iron and made them pass through the brick kiln. And this he did to all the cities of the children of Ammon and David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. In other words, they uh, put them to slave labor, basically what's saying. It's making saws, picks, axes, working at brick making and so forth. So we see when Old Testament saints are shown to be sinners, the scripture is expressing something basic about the gospel. The good news of God's love for man is not trust me and be free of your humanity. That's not what he's saying. The good news of God's love is that the Lord has committed himself to deal with sin and make us progressively more like him. For progressive growth, we always stand in the need of God's grace and aid. And God deals with sin by means of forgiveness. He's provided a mechanism by which he can forgive sin, namely his son. So the greatness of David does not lie in his perfection, but his willingness to face his sin and to return wholeheartedly to God. David is not great because he kept from sin. He's great because he knew how to deal with his sin. And so that's the fundamental lesson here. And how different he is from Saul, his predecessor. When Saul sinned, he begged Samuel to stay with him, that people might not discover God's anger. When prophet Nathan confronted David about Bathsheba, he not only confessed immediately, he even wrote a psalm used later in public worship, openly admitting his fault and sharing the inner anguish that accompanied his loss of fellowship with God. And with this, I think to go on with this, what we should do now is go forward and take a look at Psalm 51. By the way, in the, in the Hebrew vocabulary of sin, there are three major words, word groups, communicate the sin. Each of them is illustrated in, the, in these chapters. And also, each of them are used in Psalm 51. The first uh, principal uh, word for sin is chata, which means to miss the mark. It assumes the existence of a divine standard, which for some reason a person does not live up to. And all, the other terms also assume the existence of a divine standard. You recognize the world's story is that there is no divine standard. You have your truth, I have mine. The value relative is a, is a direct contradiction to God's instructions here. The other Hebrew word is pasha, which is usually translated transgressions. And the vocabulary of sin indicates a conscious revolt or rebellion against the divine standard. And the third word is avon, which is iniquity or guilt. It implies a deviation or a twisting of the standard. Now, it's interesting, even in the scripture, the language of sin includes the language of redemption because the word chatat means both sin and it also is used, the term used for a sin offering. So it speaks not only of the human failure, it speaks of the provision, the wonderful provision that God has made for forgiveness through the offering that removes our guilt. And both, all these realities are, are, are illustrated in David's experience here. So let's just take a quick, Lou, it's a review for most of us. Let's take a quick review of Psalm 51 and hear David's words as he goes here. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. No, there's no, no justification here, no extenuating circumstances, none of that. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. That's why God could say of David, here's a man after my own heart. It's not because he was sinless, it's because he dealt with it. God, he, David continues, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with the hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Make me to hear the joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now here's a verse you want to take note of, verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now, most of you realize that this psalm has been turned into a hymn that we often sing in church. And every verse, but verse 11, I think, we can sing with 
appropriateness. But verse 11 creates a problem. Because I believe that you cannot, as a Christian, claim verse 11. Because of Romans 11.29, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. If you have the Holy Spirit as a believer in Christ, it can't be taken away from you. God may take you out of the ball game. You can be unfruitful, all kinds of things. But I don't believe you can lose it once it's given to you. As Romans 11.29 and other verses. So David could say, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. But the thing that blew Paul's mind as a well-trained Pharisee in the New Testament period was the discovery, as he grew, that the Holy Spirit in, 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 to the body of Christ was given without repentance. That blew his mind. Because he remembered how Saul and David could, you know, were concerned about losing the Holy Spirit. And a believer in Christ can't lose him. He indwells you without repentance. That's interesting. Anyway, let's move on. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy, thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, or else I'd give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. Thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy uh, good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. And so it goes. See, David actually penetrated to the heart of the matter. His was no legal relationship with some bookkeeper God who cares only about balancing books. That's not David's relationship. He did not rush to ask God what he could do to make up for his sin. Instead, David realized that God's concern is personal rather than legal in nature. A contrite heart means more to God than anyone, anything that anyone could possibly do for him. And of course, with his heart attitude corrected, forgiveness could flow and the Spirit of God could work again to cleanse David. And when he was cleansed, God would work through David to do good for Zion and all his people. That's the way the thing closes. God did not condone David's sins and failings. That's not the point. But we can praise God for moving David to share honestly with us. His, less, his, his experience is a lesson for all of us. Through David, we can learn fresh lessons about the grace of God. And we are reminded that you and I are invited to come boldly to the Lord too, that he may meet us in our needs. We may not have, mur we may not have had uh, adulterous relationships. We may not have murdered uh, a husband and all that. But whatever it is we have done, Christ died for and paid for. And the lesson here is that God is concerned with the condition of our heart so that he might repair. And uh, next session, the decline continues. We're going to have this sordid episode of Amnon in chapter 13, the sin and murder of Amnon. And chapter 14, we'll see Absalom estranged from David. And Absalom attempts to capture the kingdom in chapter 15. And as you study the three chapters, we'll take three chapters next time, 13, 14, 15, when we meet again. As you read those chapters, just to make a note of a hit of fell behind the scenes as, as Absalom's counselor. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. If there is a specific sin in your life that is encumbering your relationship with God, if there's something you haven't dealt with, let this be an occasion for each of us, like David, to go before the Lord and acknowledge it so that God can focus. God's concern is the condition of our heart. There's nothing you and I can do to repair the damage that we do daily. But God has taken care of that if we will but confess it to him and repent of it. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for the lessons from David. Just as you cannot condone what he did, we know, Father, you cannot condone what we did. But we thank you, Father, you've gone to such extremes. 
is to pay for our sin with the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the lessons here, Father. Lessons of real people, not stereotypes. People who had failings. But we thank you for David's repentance. We thank you for David's response and the lessons in his response. Oh, Father, that our response might be the same. That we too would acknowledge our sin before you. And we would repent of what we've done. We just do pray, Father, that you would forgive us and cleanse us and renew us into fellowship as we plead the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for us for this very reason. And Father, as we go forth, we pray, Father, that you would help each of us to continue to grow in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And help us, Father, to understand more clearly what it is you'd have of each of us in the days that remain. Help us, Father, to be more effective witnesses, more fruitful stewards of your grace and mercy to us. Help us, Father, to be more pleasing in your sight as we commit ourselves without any reservations into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.